<coughs> well, first, first things first. As you notice from the program, I made slight changes to my title. Um, I, I can come back on that later on to explain exactly why I changed it. Uh, but um, the title is kind of a joke with the latest book by Judith Butler and Gayatari Spivak, which is called, entitled, um, Who Sings the Nation State? Um, who Sings the Nation State? Yeah, that's it. And um, ever since I began my research, there's been this going, uh, ongoing discussions about uh, all these transnational imaginaries about Bangladesh. What would be, what would be the best, if you want, national project for um, contemporary Bangladesh? between secular and non-secular segments. And the whole discussion on Shonar Banga was very funny to put up in the title. So the whole idea is to mix this who sings the nation state with who sings Shonar Banga in one way or the other. Now, what I'll be speaking to you about today is part of a larger research I began uh, 10 years ago uh, for my PhD in 2003 with Bangladeshi migrants in Lisbon. By then, no one knew anything about what was going on. And so I decided, in a context where there was lots of funding to do research on migration, uh, I decided to do something on Bangladeshis. Um, well, my, main, my PhD, which was finished in 2008, was focused mainly on transnational social fields of different kinds. So for instance, from family relations, economics, ritual, uh, but also political. Pretty much the whole thesis is about the creation of transnational social fields between Bangladesh and Portugal. Um, now, for a time period after I finished my PhD, um, I started doing another research on another topic, and in 2011, I kind of revisited my field, kind of resumed what I was doing um, for a PhD, and part of what I'll be presenting today is a mix between what I collected during my PhD and contemporary development of the Bangladeshi community, um, and allow me to speak in this sense just now. Um, but I'll be, instead of focusing I'll, 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 in this new kind of phase of my research, I'm not necessarily focusing on um, specifically on transnationalism, or, but more on aspirations and subjectivities. Well, this whole long-distance nationalism comes into place precisely in these discussions. So, today my presentation will focus mainly on the way these loser Bangladeshis, and I can explain why I'm using the loser Bangladeshis, have been making a political space for themselves, both in Portugal and in Bangladesh. Well, it all began with this, um, the, the creation of a replica of the Shahid Minar in downtown Lisbon, in a square in downtown Lisbon, in on the 21st of February, 2011. Um, let me just show you this. Um, it was the first time uh, that uh, the Language Day was celebrated in a public space as a main square in downtown Lisbon. Um, so the whole, um, the whole program included not only the creation of a replica of the Shahid Minar, but also a small version of the Ecoche Fair, um, you had these all cultural programs going around. Um, and the whole event uh, was marked by some interesting moments. So for instance, um, on your right side, uh, top, top right side, you have um, members of a specific political group coming to deposit a crown of flowers in honor of the martyrs of the 21st of the language movement and uh, the, the independence war. So mm, the three main political groups that um, are mobilized among Bangladeshis in Lisbon came to pay their respects, and I'll speak to them, I'll speak about them in a minute, came to pay their respects for the Martis um, uh, in this same event. At the same time, you had some representatives of the Portuguese public authorities, or Portuguese authorities, namely members of the municipal council coming to the celebrations. Um, and it was, Ever since I began my research, it was the most public demonstration and the most public presence of Bangladeshis uh, in the Portuguese public space until that moment. Um, so what I want to 
what I want to discuss today is departing on, from this event, what, what is implied in this event? What, what are the agencies, what are the, the political projects that are more or less entangled in the organization of this event? Um, one thing uh, I need to explain first, first things first, is that this celebration was intimately attached to the creation of a kind of an umbrella organization to represent Bangladeshis um, regarding the Portuguese authorities. And at the same time, this same association would be an interlocutor with the Bangladeshi authorities themselves in Bangladesh. Um, so this is kind of an event that was done as a runner-up to an electoral process that would lead to the creation of a new association. So the mobilization of these, all these three political factions, so the Awami League supporters, uh, BNP supporters, and uh, Jamaat Islami supporters, for instance, were, in a way, these mobilizations were in themselves seen as kind of a pre-electoral process leading up to the elections that would be realized later on in April that year. Um, now, what I want to argue today is that this event not only is related to what one could eventually define as a long-distance nationalism uh, regarding, say, what national identity in Bangladesh should be, um, but it's also about carving um, a political space for Bangladesh in contemporary Portugal. So the same event kind of has this ambiguous tones and signifiers and symbols in the sense that, on one hand, it is part and parcel of political participation, informal if you want, in Bangladesh, but at the same time, it's part and parcel of the formal political participation in Portugal. Um, now, in order to explore this, I'm using a notion which is fairly simple, which is called public trans uh, a concept uh, entitled public transnationalism, which has been developed by these two academics, right, Ruth Kupmans and Paul Statham, um, which argue that public transnationalism is the aspect of transnationalism that involves the interpenetration of public spheres and political identities of the sending country and the country of settlement. So, what I'm really arguing is that this small event in downtown Lisbon, associated with a population of no more than 5,000 people, is part and parcel of the creation of transnational public sphere. Okay. Um, so in a way, the the, this celebration of the 21st February 2011 is the meeting place of these two political uh, and public spaces. This, uh, and before carrying on, this is pretty much inspired on the work of several other academics that have been working, for instance, on British Bangladeshis, such as Claire Alexander, John E, David Garvin, all these authors that have been working precisely on these transnational dimensions of uh, British Bangladeshi political field. So in a way, it crosses uh, who sings the nation state on one hand and um, work done on British Bangladeshis um, in the UK. Now in order to explore this, um, this argument, I'm going, to, I'm going to be focusing on four points. Um, first one is a brief history of Bangladeshi migration to Portugal. Um, the, the second one, the second point I'll be exploring is uh, factional politics in the dark of Lisbon and long distance nationalism. The third is how Bangladeshis are making a place for themselves in the Portuguese public space. And then I'll come to my concluding remarks. So, first things first. I will tell you my own history of Bangladeshis in Portugal, if you want. Uh, well, most Bangladeshis in Portugal, uh, well, this is a very recent migration began in the late 80s, 1989, to be more precise, around there. Um, and it grew significantly all throughout the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, again, we're talking about this very small phenomenon, so kind of the statistics, different sources go around with all this, uh, as it always happens, these in imprecise numbers, but they suggest something like 4,500, 5,000 people. Uh, but the numbers will dwindle because lots of them have become Portuguese nationals, so they will disappear from statistics. All this kind of, all this usual, usual mess with the numbers, yeah. But just to give you a rough idea, anyway. So most of, most of my interlocutors um, come from this 
middle class background back in Bangladesh. Most of them come from urbanized families with relative high levels of educational capital. So for instance, some of my interlocutors studied um, political science in Dhaka University, others had graphic designer um, graduations, um, they were fairly fluent in English. Um, most of them come from cities such as Dhaka or Komila or Chittagong, although they keep lots of relatives in villages, one way or the other. So, um, so most of them come from this very middle class background. Their own families have entrepreneurial positions back in Bangladesh, say, for instance, shops in the market in Dhaka or uh, public servants. Uh, so it's pretty much a kind of a middle class uh, and, and uh, um, an erupting middle class or a growing middle class, sorry. Um, the, the, mo the reason why they came to Portugal in the first place, I usually say for fun, no one left Bangladesh in the 1990s to come to Lisbon. Well, that, that wouldn't happen. They were leaving Bangladesh to come to Europe. Uh, and only once in Europe did they end up in Portugal. And I'll come to this in a minute. Um, first things first, why did they decide to go out of Bangladesh in the first place? Well, most of my interlocutors were in a kind of a paradoxical structural position. They had, their parents had invested significantly in their education, um, but they couldn't access the labor market according to their own expectations. Um, so they could eventually, I don't know, they could eventually ended up working in their parents' shops, say, in Newmarket, but they didn't want to do that, one way or the other. Um, so, facing a situation where their access to the labor market was either non-existent or under conditions that they would consider above, uh, low, uh, below their expectations, um, some of them began thinking about moving away, especially in a context where you have all this, as you all know, all this culture of migration, all this politics around uh, going away, going to be dash, especially among certain strata of, of contemporary Bangladeshi society, uh, it becomes quite easily to understand how for these younger uh, middle class members, going abroad became a solution. Um, at the same time, not, ac not accessing the labor market in, in the position according to their expectations was synonymous with the fact that, that the life, their life course projects could not develop. So for instance, they could not marry, they could not, in a way, progress to adulthood. Um, so coming to Europe was seen as a first step in some kind of not only um, trying to cons consume something that one could eventually call the modern, uh, but also a way of proceeding with one's life course. Uh, so there's a, that's why I'm talking about this paradoxical structural position that led some of these young guys to Europe. Um, again, now coming back to the point that no one left Bangladesh in the 1990s to come to Lisbon, um, most of them came to, to continental Europe, um, and most of them ended up in countries such as Portugal, Spain, and Italy, uh, because as soon as they, get, they got in Europe, uh, most of them ended up in illegal, undocumented situations, which were very difficult to circumvent in countries such as France or Austria, uh, but in the 1990s, all throughout the 1990s, both Italy, Spain, and Portugal developed uh, regularization programs uh, for migrants. And lots of Bangladeshis moved to these countries to get documents that were, they were unable to access elsewhere in Europe. Now, keep in mind that this is, if you invest 6,000 euros to buy a Schengen visa in Dhaka, and for that, you have sold a piece of land or whatever, your family. Uh, the, the last thing that you want to, to do is to come to Europe and face a situation of deportability. So the whole idea of getting a document is absolutely essential because it's the guarantee that you won't be sent back with one hand in front of you, the other with nothing in your pocket. Uh, so the whole strategy is precisely, look, first things first, we need something that allows us to stay in Europe. Um, and so it was also a strategy of, of um, defending themselves from the possibility of being deported. That, that's, that's, that's the idea. So that's how they ended up coming to Portugal. And now you'll be asked, but how does this happen? So how do they know, being in Austria, 
So everyone knows everyone. Uh, so mobiles are wonder, a wonder, a wonderful technologies of spreading information. And while I was doing field work for my PhD, everyone was always asking, look, is there going, is there, will there be a regularization process in Spain with better documents? Or someone was saying in Italy that there was going to open a, a special program. So in one way or the other, everybody knew um, how things would work. Now, regarding other characterization elements, labor market. Most of these Bangladeshis that in, uh, arrived in Portugal in the 1990s, uh, began working in the lower ranks of the Portuguese economy. And keep in mind that by, by the 1990s, Portugal was kind of, the economy was booming. And it, there was lots of infrastructural programs going on. There was lots of place, um, the, the, there was lots of labor, one, uh, work, sorry. There, were, there was lots of work. Not just like now, but anyway. Um, uh, so, most of these young Bangladeshis began working in construction and other areas of the lower ranks of the Portuguese market, uh, but as soon as possible, with the help from their parents in Bangladesh or with friends, they invested in these small businesses. And most of them invested in um, these small gross businesses. Most went into garments, gross selling. Um, and later on, they began investing in restaurants, um, in groceries, um, in tourist-directed shops, so for instance, selling uh, memorabilia from Portugal to tourists in downtown Lisbon, for instance. Um, and currently, the big contemporary economic strategy, uh, due to the huge uh, economic crisis that is going on with the gross businesses, they have been converting their economic capital into scattered groceries serving kind of the traditional neighborhoods in Lisbon. Um, now, uh, another element of, cap of characterization is, well, most of this migration began, of course, as male, do done by uh, young adults, single, uh, but as soon as they got uh, their documents from Portugal, they went back to Bangladesh to get married. Um, it, it, look, it's statistically like this, it's kind of, no one I knew that got document uh, stopped going, but it was like, Got legal, went to Bangladesh, and then began to prepare for a wedding, one way or the other. These were very small ceremonies, um, in the sense that there were small, a small group of people, the wives would usually stay with uh, his parents or her parents, depending on the, the strategies and the values around what would be the correct practice. Uh, then they came back to, to Portugal and began preparing for bringing their wives to, to Portugal which included buying a household or renting a, an apartment, uh, investing more properly in a household, in a business, all this kind of stuff. Which meant that by 2001, 2003, there was a huge movement of um, women and children moving huge relative to the, the configuration of the communications in Portugal, okay? the size. Uh, there was a significant movement of family reunification to Portugal. Um, so there was this recomposition of households uh, in, in, in Lisbon. Um, at the same time, and two other elements of, uh, categorize, of, of characterization, there's a huge investment in their children's education. Most Bangladeshis in Lisbon have invested significantly in the education of their kids, either in the, po in the Portuguese public schools or in what in England would be uh, what in the UK is called faith schools. So for instance, Islamic colleges that have secular curriculum at the same time. One of them is very famous because it, it's on, on, one of these schools is on, it's on the uh, top position in the, um, the ranking of schools in Portugal regarding uh, the results of these students. So their parents invested heavily in, in the education of these children. Having said this, and I'm talking about only Portugal until now, they keep huge ties with Bangladesh, of course. We might eventually be seeing nuclear households, but they are only apparently nuclear. They are part of the, this, all this Chotko Poriba uh, notion, this idea of the enlarged household, only that it stretches, say, from Dhaka to a village in Kumila, and then to a household in Lisbon, which everything is connected one way or the other. Um, so it's only a question of extended uh, expansion in space. And this is a a picture of a Kurbani uh, that was taken 
while uh, I was doing field work in 2004 when I went back uh, to, with a family when they were visiting uh, their relatives um, in Dhaka. Um, and they were there to, do, to prepare the wedding of one of the, of the guys, of the, of the children, of the, uh, of the, yes, one of the guys, sorry. And also to do the Kurbani that wasn't done back in Bangladesh ever since 1980, done the late 1980s. So there's a huge connection, there was a huge, and there's still a huge connection between Bangladesh and Portugal. The latest interesting element, well, several of these Bangladeshis have become Portuguese nationals. Um, so they, had, they now have uh, Portuguese nationality, um, especially those that arrived around the first half of the 1990s. Now, proceeding. Factional politics and long distance nationalism. Now, among Bangladeshis, um, down in Lisbon, um, you have lots of divisions, of course. Imagine that you'll find a population that has, at some point, had 18, and I'll spell it out again, 18 regional informal associations. That there's no huge presence of Siletis or Dakans or Chittagongis or whatever. No, it, it, everyone is scattered, everyone is from a different place, which is interesting in itself. Uh, but there's another line of division which crisscrosses all this, which is factional politics. Um, all this separation between supporters of the Wami League, supporters of the PNP, and supporters of Jamaat Islami. Um, these are kind of, it's, if you want, it, it doesn't, it doesn't include all the population, of course. It's pretty much the, the, an arena of competition between what I call big men, in the sense that they are very successful, and using politics is also a way of affirming their own success in one way or the other. Um, but it, it, it is a, a, a cleavage that goes all around a certain segments of contemporary Bangladeshi community in Portugal. Now, this has very interesting uh, elements attached to it. So, all throughout 2003, when I began my field work until today, every year everybody was organizing, say for instance, Alami League supporters were organizing the celebrations of the 21st of February, and then BNP would do a separate, a separate thing, and then Jamaat Islamis would do another separate thing, and then um, uh, and Alami League supporters would celebrate Victory Day, but say Jamaat Islamis wouldn't. Uh, so there's all this um, organization of a kind of a celebratory space for manifestations of nationalism coming from different segments associated with different different ideologies regarding nationalism. Um, my argument is that these celebrations are not simply a way of reproducing kind of blindly these nationalist projects. They are a way of making them. In the sense, it's a processual thing. In the sense that you are discussing in Europe something that you want to project onto the creation in Bangladesh. So it's, it's, it's competing, project, competing projects that are using kind of a European public space in order to affirm something that they want to be dominant in Bangladeshi society. So it's in a way, it's a long distance nationalism in this sense. It's not simply, I want to celebrate the 21st of February because, well, I've been taught, it has been, no. I will celebrate the 21st of February because, for instance, Shonar Bangla is important for me, I'm associated with other left secular segments and I want a secular state, while someone else is... So it's, it's a, a political agenda in a way, not necessarily associated with uh, votes, but it associated with lobbying, sorry, lobbying, etc. Well, the whole construction of the replica of the Shahid Mina is exactly that, coming from a specific segment. I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, so let me just say this. When, regarding my argument, when you have, on your top right, you have these members of the army league coming to present their respects to the martyrs, the martyrs, they are not just doing something that they consider should be done. They are kind of projecting like this the construction of a possible future, alternative future for contemporary Bangladesh. That's what I'm suggesting. Anyway. So, this, <clears throat> this uh, all this polarization, ends up having this very key moment. So for instance, in 2004, Dewa Saidi came to Lisbon and did a, a, a lecture uh, in, a, in Lisbon Central Mosque. And 
uh, lots of the supporters of a cer certain segments of course, Awami League, uh, were willing to organize a protest in front of the Lisbon Central Mosque, which is run by Indians coming from Mozambique, Portuguese, which are the main representatives of Islam in the, in the Portuguese public space, and said to the Awami League supporters, look, you're not going to do this in front of my mosque. Uh, Del Asadi will come, but and he will speak, and you'll be quiet about the whole thing. And so Awami League supporters kind of stopped uh, going, and now more recently, the death penalty of uh, Del Wasaidi, um, which was hugely discussed, not only among uh, Jamaat Islamic supporters, but also among with Awami League supporters, and especially in Facebook. Facebook of young Bangladeshis in Portugal has become this tool for contesting all these contemporary politics in Bangladesh. Um, and not only in contemporary politics, but also memory and history. All these kind of readings and re-readings of who's right, who, who really was taking place, what was really taking place in 1971 that would lead to um, what, has, what is happening nowadays. Um, now, this, uh, this factional politics uh, is partially supported by these transnational visits of politicians. So in 2004, Dawa Saidi was there, went there to lecture on Islam. But in 2011, Dopi Muni, for instance, went to Lisbon on a totally different agenda, uh, but was received by the main representatives of the Army League. Um, and it was seen as an element that, in a way, is reinforced or oh, reinforces this all factional division and political division among Bangladeshis uh, in Lisbon. What I'm trying to say is that both coming from the state or all political parties in Bangladesh, Europe is of course a space that you can co-opt in a way or the other to create a kind of a transnational citizenry. In the sense that you want to mobilize their support according to your cause. And so these visits are part and parcel of this transnational public space, in Bangladesh transnational public space. Um, yeah, this is it. Okay, now uh, this three pictures just for you. Well, this is the visit of Dopi Muni, and these are some of the representatives of the Army League. This is the celebration of the 21st February 2007, I think, organized by BNP supporters. And this one is uh, a small political uh, rally run by Awami League supporters um, on the, this, the death of some members of the Awami League, which I, for, for this moment in time, I forgot, but I can check my notes anyway. So, all this, all this, these are the, the, the main factional and long distance nationalism elements I wanted to highlight. Now, coming to my third point, Making a place for Bangladesh is important. Um, now, in, in, I have to do a prior, a prior notice, a disclaimer. Well, in Portugal, the model of citizenship is not multiculturalism or ethnic and racial relations or whatever. It's kind of this intercultural model of citizenship, which means ends up being translated into this. Each migrant community is represented as being coming from a national background. Everyone is kind of either Bangladeshi or Brazilian or, or Hungarian or whatever. Which means that the way they participate in the public space, besides the form of voting, when you have nationality or you are allowed to vote, uh, you participate in the public space with associations that are organized in national terms. Okay? Uh, so for instance, the Association of Bangladesh is in Portugal, fair enough. Um, and the whole public space has been built upon this idea of communities. So if you want to use the, the, the whole discussion of Gerd Bauman in, in Southall, it's, it's not necessarily cultural, but it's this idea of communities are there. It doesn't matter where you come from, you're always from a community, specific community which is, has national backgrounds. Um, now the creation of this association that I was telling you, you about, which is behind this 21st February 2011, is a direct response to this. As I just mentioned, Bangladeshis in Lisbon are divided along several lines, regional backgrounds, political affiliations, you name it, there's lots of fragmentations. But the need to produce a community, 
is itself instigated by the Portuguese public space, which is, look, we need, in a way, the public space for migrants is organized in this way. So you're, if you want to respond, you need to respond according to the terms of the governmentality, if, if you to use Foucault in this discussion. Uh, now, the location of the event is not random. This square, this square is, in, again, it's, in, in the, uh, it's fairly downtown in Lisbon, and it's known as uh, an immigrant neighborhood. You have Bangladeshis, you have Chinese there, you have Pakistanis, Indians, Indians from Mozambique, Cape Verdeans. It's, it's not necessarily the only place where you'll find migrants or descendants of migrants or whatever, uh, but it's a place that became known in Portugal as this, the place for diversity, okay? And the whole discussion around this square and adjacent areas is that this multicultural locus in contemporary Lisbon. Uh, so the event was, in a way, this 21st of February was produced in order to specifically communicate with this dominant narrative about this uh, neighborhood in downtown Lisbon. Uh, just for you to have an idea, if there are uh, cultural expressions of diversity, something like Sharon Zukin would describe as the aesthetization of difference is in this neighborhood. All this notion of fusion markets, <coughs> multicultural carnivals, all this kind of stuff, it's always there. It's, it's, it's very interesting because it's literally the location of multiculturalism in a way um, in downtown Lisbon. So these Bangladeshis are, when they are producing this event, they are themselves making a claim. And when they are, and they are making a claim with regarding, for instance, uh, Portuguese uh, representatives of the many political spectrum, this, this gentleman here in the middle is um, a member of the municipal assembly elected by the Socialist Party. Um, which is the main representative for, for, for the main responsible for cultural activities in several areas of the city. And here, on, the, on his right side, um, you have uh, one of the leaders of the Alami League, which is himself, which he himself is part of the Socialist Party in Portugal. So there's this kind of collection of economic, political capital that feed onto each other in making a place for Bangladeshis in contemporary Portugal. Um, so, okay, coming to my final notes. Um, well, my final notes are, I'll go back to my argument. My first argument um, is that the, the organization of this 21st of February can be interpreted as an effort to build a transnational public space between Portugal and Bangladesh. So on one hand, the celebration is a single example, among many others, of the way several sectors of the Bangladeshi population in Portugal compete for the definition of a dominant discursive formation regarding long-distance nationalism, Bangladesh, secularism, Islam, whatever. What is at stake is precisely the production of a something back to Bangladesh in terms of a transnational imaginary. Second, on the other hand, the same event, the same exact event that we're discussing is part and parcel of the production of a political place for Bangladeshis in contemporary Portuguese society. So they feed onto each other in one way, which is very interesting. It's kind of a game of mirrors, one, one and the other. Um, and to finish, in the first agenda, so to produce something regarding the future of Bangladesh, you participate according to certain criteria. So you participate as a member of Bangladeshi political party. And you mobilize accordingly, in this sense. Now in Portugal, you mobilize not as a member of the Wami League, you mobilize as a Bangladeshi member of a Bangladeshi community. So in a way, you create it. The whole Portuguese public space creates the idea of a community in the first place, okay? Which is much more complex than the simple portrait of a community. And I think that that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, about 45 minutes for uh, questions and discussion and, uh, and so on. I think we already have somebody over there. Do you mind uh, turning the lights on?
what I'm trying to say is all these dynamics are pretty much invisible. They are pretty much turned on inside. You know? uh, but what happens is, of course, just what happens in, in formal terms is this. The persons who won the elections associated with the BNP, since they didn't have any social capital regarding the access to the Portuguese public establishment, they couldn't get in. They couldn't access the High Commissioner for Migration and Intercultural Dialogue. They couldn't actually have a meeting with them because no one knew who they were. You see what I'm saying? My point is, the, the Portuguese pol political establishment, in a way, uh, would relate better with someone that they knew from their own networks than it began conversations with someone that they know nothing about. You see, I don't know if this, uh, in a sense, they, they, this can, they don't know. They don't know, and to be honest, they don't seem to care. <laughs> Could I just say that's actually the case with all the other communities as well, the Angolans, the, the yeah, yeah. from Mozambique, and so yeah. they all have the same problems in relating, and their internal exactly. problems and relating to Absolutely the political right. establishment. Absolutely right. Let, let me just add one thing to this, which is, for instance, the main, the, 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 the persons who have, in any way, a migrant background, that participate in the Portuguese public space, um, they they come in as kind of representatives of migrant constituencies, which are the big ones, and through directly through the political establishment, uh, through the Portuguese political establishment, say for instance the, so the Socialist Party or the Social Democrat Party, and eventually the the Catholic the Catholic right, especially among the old ones. Um, and I've got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, I was, I mean, thinking about long distance nationalism, Anderson, for example, mm -hmm. um, says that that's a first generation phenomenon mm -hmm. and it's related very much to myths of return. So um, that the kind of involvement in, in you know, Bangladeshi political parties is part of a kind of awareness that you might return and then have political influence in Bangladesh and that, that, that doesn't necessarily then filter down to later generations. So um, I'm thinking about whether is the are the looser Bangladeshis are they are they planning to stay in Portugal in, in your discussions with them, do they think that they will eventually return as the kind of first generation of Bangladeshis here kind of anticipated but then often didn't kind of live out that, that reality. And connected to that, um, thinking about economic flows as well and um, how, how are remittances working in terms of uh, the Bangladeshi community in Portugal and uh, investment in Bangladesh. Um, uh, it, I mean, the, I'm interested that the politicians are coming to Portugal so they clearly see, and it's a middle class entrepreneurial kind of uh, migrant population, so I can see that they might be a new target for Bangladeshi investment because, you know, saying we, it's, a, it's a crisis that's being faced by the Bangladeshi government with regards to investment declining from Britain mm -hmm. because we're on the third, fourth generation now, much less interested in, in buying land in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. um, for example. So um, then my kind of third question is about it, what you touched on with the Bangladeshi mosque mm -hmm. and the faith school which I'm really interested in and about also about the kind of the place of Islam alongside this kind of these uh, this uh, political participation it seems quite interesting to me that you know that, that there are these faith schools developing and also regional mosques as mm -hmm. well um, and again, then you said that, that, that it's a small population. So how is the Bangladeshi community seen by the majority Portuguese community? How are they responded to? And um, in terms of like things like faith schools or mosques, is there resistance to them? Is there um, kind of a sense that this is this that um, the celebration of Ekushi is also about not assimilating? I mean, like, or if it does the intercultural model enable um, that kind of juggling of identities more easily in a Portuguese context? 
Mm. Uh, finally, question about gender. Um, and the kind of the arrival of, of the women and the children and um, just anything that you have to say about, uh, about their, their lives and the challenges they might have learning Portuguese. And Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to begin with the last one, gender. Gender issues, yes. Um, that has been uh, one area that I, I, one way or the other, it's less explored in my research. Namely, what I say gender is, is about the women's perspectives, that's what I'm saying. Uh, because there's lots of stuff which is related in my own work on masculinities, for instance. Um, but, so this has been an area that um, I wasn't able to explore as deeply as I wanted, although in the case of uh, families that I know, um, well, there's this, uh, what is interesting is the discursive constructions about the modernity of nuclear families according to certain things. So for instance, um, some of the, and this is a note on gender specific, uh, if women should work in the shops or not, and how this is associated with an idea of having a modern family. Um, and this, is a, this has been a, ten, a discussion that has been going on among the kind of the older generation of migrants, well, the first generation, the first generation of migrants, the process of women itself. Now, of course, the migration of women uh, to, to Portugal from Bangladesh has been, of course, um, mediated by their husbands and then by their husbands' families. So it's, it's, it's not an autonomous migration in one way or the other. Um, but they are absolutely essential in several things, namely uh, the construction of networks of support according to several families, some kind of a, a bit a day kind of stuff. Yeah. We have all these supportive networks that move, or move informally regarding the participation of men in the public space, if, if you want. Uh, but to be honest, the perspective of women has been always a side that unfortunately I wasn't able to explore as well as I could. Um, now, let me go back to my, your, your first point. Now, regarding coming backs, first thing, long distance nationalism and the coming back, or the idea of coming back. Um, it's a great question, um, because there's one thing, all this long distance nationalism is pretty much the parents, the first, well, the, the migrant generation that is engaged in. It's not the kids. Most of their children are not engaged in this, except those that, uh, due to this whole Islamophobic transnational environment, um, have been kind of approaching, for instance, uh, um, Jamaat Islami, Islamic Forum, all this kind of stuff as a way to argue, look, in spite of all this Islamophobic globalization, uh, we are probably Muslims. Uh, of course, you have other segments That's of the- nationalists. No, no, there's not That's national. Separate, separate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely separate. But they, they are not, not they are engaged, they are, in a way, they, they are not nationalists. They are not nationalists in that sense, but they are, as Peter van der Veer called our attention, is they are religious nationalists in the sense that they contest the idea that uh, Bangladeshis should, in a way, create, that's their argument, artificial uh, divisions between Muslims, in the sense that they would be kind of... But they already did it, this is my question, that was my question, but they're already doing it with other migrant communities. Yeah. No, but, but the idea is precisely to create this transnational... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's a different thing, because you, they, there's a, a large sector of the younger generation that couldn't care less about what's going on with factional politics. Ah, they want to play soccer and cricket and go out with friends, and they, they, it's really something that they... So it's pretty much a, the generation of migrants' involvement in long distance national, and this is absolutely tied up with two things. The possibility of going back constantly, so they, they go back and forth, so they are pretty much tied up in Bangladesh through several networks. Uh, family, economics, whatever. So I'll give you an example. A family, a guy I know very closely. He yearly goes back to Bangladesh to have a meeting with his three brothers in order to 
uh, kind of see the going on of businesses from new market to land in da in Chidagong, in Noakali, and then uh, the three shops the, the older brother has in Lisbon. And they manage the whole thing as, as a corporate unit. Um, so first of all, there's a continuous link to Bangladesh, um, which of course is uh, 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 an element of the first generation, and this is clearly linked to this long distance nationalism, the idea that they want to come back. If they go back, even if even if for holidays, as successful migrants. They, they, they don't want to go back as, uh, the whole problem is that you won't go there with a penny in your pocket. You, you spend a lot of money saving to go back because you need to show that you can be successful as well as others before you. Um, so it's pretty much tied up to the generational stuff. Regarding the comeback, let me just say one thing. Um, there's a huge insistence of burying the dead in Bangladesh. And there's a huge investment coming from all sectors. This is the only moment, I can say, where uh, factional politics, inter-regional differences are overcome, which is where you need to send someone else's body back to Bangladesh. Because it might be you in the future. And so it doesn't matter if you're coming from Awami, Jamaat, it doesn't matter. They're all Bangladesh, you should organize it. This is the only moment, I would say. Very similar parallel to the second generation. Okay. It's, it's a very Victor Turner community mm -hmm. thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. Like but, okay. now, but now, people wanting to be buried in, in Britain. Yes. And it's a different kind of challenge to create that kind of buried yes. place. But yeah. Now that you mentioned that, it's very really good that you mentioned that because among the most established members, mm -hmm. there's, gro there's this growing discourse of construction about the idea, look, I have my kids here, my wife is here, okay, I have my brothers back in Bangladesh, fair enough, but my businesses are here, I have my households here, I have done everything here, I'm here for more years than I spent in Bangladesh, the, but this is the older ones, the guys that arrived in 1989, for instance, uh, were very young when they arrived, so they began what, begin wondering that they should be eventually buried in the Islamic cemetery, which exists in this, not, it's not a, a whole cemetery, Islamic section of a cemetery. Uh, and they consider this possibility now. So let me just finish with the third point that you mentioned, which is um, how are they seen in the Portuguese public space? Well, Bangladeshis are, most of the visibility of migration in Portugal is not regarding Bangladeshis or Pakistan, contemporary migrations of Bangladesh and Pakistanis. It's all about migrants in one way or the other linked by the colonial uh, Thai in one way or the other, which are the demographically more numerous population. And in a way, they are categorized in the same place of all levels, from racial racialization to class position, they are all kind of pushed to the same position as Indians coming from Mozambique. Because they have pretty much the same structural position they are doing pretty much the same kind of businesses, um, and to the mainstream public construction, there's no difference. The, in, in, in Portugal, is a very classist, raci racialized society, so it's there. But since we're talking about this middle class, migrant middle class, it's also kind of very much invisibilized, if you want. Um, and I think that I will stop it. I think that you. Oh, thank you, Jose, for that um, insight. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the um, history of this, if I may say, uh, partisan uh, rather than political matters. Like you mentioned, the division between uh, the different political parties in Bangladesh and how that's translated uh, or sort of carried through in, in the, the, the migrants in, in Portugal. And if you could um, trace them uh, when they arrived in the 80s and 90s, or is it, when did this emerge? Um, and how did this emerge? And has it intensified at the, um, at, at the, um, at the same, um, with, the, with the same propensity as intensified in Bangladesh? Because in, you know, in Bangladesh, uh, the rivalry has, uh, was not so much in the 90s as it's now. So with, um, every five or 10 years, it's intensified. I mean, that's reflected 
uh, in the factions and the rivalries between the parties in the work. And, and finally, if I may sort of uh, pick your brain on this, on the identity issue of Bangladeshis in, in Portugal and how this uh, uh, sort of um, this micro uh, identity of uh, being a, what, what does it mean being a supporter of Army League or a sub supporter of BNP and how are these two identities as Portuguese uh, uh, to these individuals or these communities. Um, so if you can sort of look into the, uh, at the very micro level uh, identity of uh, sort of how this is seeped down at the very bottom of who they are in, 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 in the contemporary uh, Portuguese community and how, the, how, how do they see that as a, as a diversion from being a Bangladeshi or being a Bangladeshi in the group. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, First, how does this, how did this emerge in the first place? Uh, there's a, almost like a mythological moment that is pinpointed as the moment where all this erupted. And it comes up specifically among a group of the, a very small group of Bangladeshis that first arrived in Portugal. And the story goes like this. There are lots of different versions, of course, as always it happens. But there was a moment where the first arrivals had a dinner to create an association. And it was a moment where it was supposed to be picked a leader, a possible leader. And everything erupted from there. For the community, for the association, for the association. For the association. They wanted to create an association in order to dialogue with the Portuguese authorities. And from there, there was a huge discussion of who, who was this? Sorry? When was this? This was, well, there's a, a version, the version I know, and this is a very uh, mythologized narrative, and this all happened around 1993, in a very famous dinner in Porto, where everybody kind of had drink, had drink a bit too much, and huge discussions erupted after that, because who was supposed to be uh, the leader? And there's a dimension to factional politics, especially to the heads of each uh, faction, uh, which is tied up to this dinner. They separated uh, partially on questions of personal in animosity. So it's not only a question of factional politics in itself, it's also a question of personal disputes. Yeah? But what happened was, ever since there, Ever since this moment, um, and what you see is there's lots of events that lead up to this um, encroachment of divisions in one way or the other, all throughout the period. Now, of course, there's the other thing you were asking is it does intensify all this factional politics intensifies with political events in Bangladesh. So whenever there's something which, say, for instance, the condemnation of Saudi. Uh, it it um, uh, translated into lots of political participation in Facebook and in discussions in coffee shops and stuff. Um, the other events that usually intensify <coughs> the factional politics are when it comes to the control of institutions. Whenever there is an election process for the Moscow committee or whenever there's uh, the possibility of creating something new, the factional politics shows itself very, very feasible. And also when, for instance, politicians <coughs> come from the Bangladesh stay for some periods. What does it mean to be an Awami League and a Portuguese citizen at the same time? That's a question interesting. Because I tend to consider that um, I tend to consider that um, due to the fact that the Portuguese public space doesn't uh, in any way engage with political affiliations to Bangladesh, they tend to be, maybe I'm mistaken, I'm thinking at the moment, uh, I, never, I never thought about this this way, uh, they tend to be kind of separate dimensions of subjectivity. In the sense that you either participate as a Portuguese citizen in the Portuguese public space, as an entrepreneur, for instance, 
you don't usually participate in Portuguese public space as the leader of the one league. You, you don't. You, you simply don't. Um, uh, you participate in factional politics in, among Bangladeshis in Lisbon as a member of the OMD, or you go back to Bangladesh and you participate in politics as a member of, but you don't do it in Portugal, in the Portuguese public space, because first things first is who, who are, what is a OMD? No one knows anything about, in the, 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 what I'm saying is the mainstream political spectrum. No one knows anything about it, so it doesn't make any sense for you to be saying, I'm from OMD, so what? Um, you see what I'm saying? Um, so, in terms of formal political participation, I wouldn't say that it has any consequences. Now, as regarding other things, the mobilization of social capital, uh, influence, possible investments, it's very important. Coming specifically from the segments inside the community. So, because you're not only a member of OMD because you believe in secularism or whatever, you're also a member of OMD or dramatic economy or something else, because it's also a way of accumulating social capital in one way or the other. It's also a way of mobilizing resources for, for things that you want to do, also in Portugal. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe, I don't know if this answers. Okay, so you're saying that um, in that case, in the UK, that okay, um, so in Portugal, so they would have to use the platform of, say, being affiliated with an army association to access certain resources. I mean, if that's the argument. So is it uh, then a problem of multiculturalism or lack of integration in the political community uh, that they would need to use this platform to um, go places, if you like? Which is in interesting if you apply the same theory in this country, because which is a much more multicultural, much more integrated society. Yet, you have as intense factional um, and divided politics. I, I, yes, let me think. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a. I don't know if it's a thing related with the model of citizenship, but it's more related with uh, the structural position one ends up in the Portuguese case, I'm not talking about uh, the British case. The structural position the first migrants ended up in the first place. Uh, what I mean is, factional politics is also tied up with this idea of mobilizing social capital. Now, this was also very important when these guys were trying to upgrade themselves in the social structure by investing in businesses. In a context where they were systematically pushed to a kind of structurally low position, you either were working as a construction worker, for instance, or something in the lower ranks of the Portuguese economy. But for instance, if you go to the labor market as a journalist that you graduated from Dhaka University, no one will hire you. It doesn't matter if you go there with the certificate, they will, yeah. no way. So the, you either work as a laborer, or as an entrepreneur, or there's nothing else. So it's, it's pretty much a question of accessing the labor market. I'm not reducing it to it, I'm just saying it. It's, a not, it's an element in it, and as well as others. Uh, and thus, in a way, factional politics is also uh, 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 an arena where you gather social capital that will allow you to have some some economic opportunities here, eventually some political opportunities there, uh, some I don't know. You see, I, I don't know if I'm making any sense. Um, regarding the model of citizenship, the thing is in Portugal, uh, the whole the whole projection of the public space makes you participate in that sense. You, if you want to participate, you have to participate like this. You are either a Muslim or a Bangladesh. If you're a Muslim, you have an umbrella association which is run by uh, Indians from Mozambique and they are the main representatives. So there, the public space is more or less taken, in a way. Or you participate as a Bangladeshi, but you cannot participate as a Wamidi member. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? You can eventually convert it and become, say, a member of a mainstream political party. 
And I look, I've been tied up to Army D ever since I was in the youth league when I was in Bangladesh. And our Army League has a secular agenda and we're very close together uh, on the left, central left political spectrum and should we, we eventually should be together. Uh, well, should, I should be allowed to participate in the Socialist Party for instance. But that's it. Even then, what I was saying here, yeah, you are the one or the other, but you cannot participate as for a particular group. Mm -hmm. But you can see other com migrant communities who were actually fractionalizing mm -hmm. and separating and saying, look, you have to do it this way. And what's your say on that? I would say that's where they cannot integrate as one would want. I don't know if I understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is, like, for example, you've got the Mozambique Muslims. You yes. say you can, you as Muslims, you can celebrate with us this and that, or participate in this and this and that, but you cannot celebrate it as a Bangladeshi. Okay, okay, okay. But they are the ones who are actually putting that blind division okay. or the invisible wall there. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. There's, okay, it's a very good, very good argument, which contradicts what I just said. And it's true because of one simple reason. In Portugal, um, if you're a migrant, you're associated with a low position in the social structure, even if you're coming from middle class. If you're a migrant, in the country. Fair enough, fair enough. But Muslims, the category Muslim in Portugal is associated with middle class, not to say elites. Well, and I have to explain this. Uh, the main representatives of the public Islam in Portugal are for instance, one of them is the owner of a major investment bank in Portugal. So it's, we're talking about a global elite, yeah, which controls the image of Islam in Portugal. Um, and this segment, we're talking about Portuguese citizens ever since the 1960s, due to colonial, in the, in the context of the colonial period. Um, what there's a place for public Islam, which is controlled by a small entrepreneurial elite, we're not talking about petty entrepreneurs, we're talking about owners of banks, hotel chains, all this kind of stuff, and they're not migrants. And they don't position themselves as migrants. We are Muslims, Portuguese citizens, and we don't participate in the same public space as migrants. We participate in the public space of the Catholics, of the Protestants, of the Jewish, but we don't participate in the public space of migrants. Now, Bangladeshis, despite being middle class in terms of their structural position in the labor market, they can participate only in with instruments of migrant communities. I don't know if I'm making myself a good And it and so there's a keep in mind that Portugal is a high classist society. And the whole I'm not saying that Indians from Mozambique are all elite. I'm saying that who controls public Islam is an elite, it's a global elite. Brother, we're running out of time, so uh, it's Fuad. Fuad, you next time. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, Abdul Karim said it'd be wicked, and, and, and it was. Um, I don't think about Portuguese and Bangladesh that much, but when I do, I think of pirates of the Bay of Bengal, <laughs> and then I think of the Islamic heritage of Portugal, and then I think of the potential of Afro Asian uh, Congress and decolonial politics amongst the immigrants and I think you were just talk you were talking to like a load of Sasa's uncle types, right? In your research? Yeah, so sorry, they didn't understand. It seems to me like Oh first generation, so okay, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. To Sasas. Um, which you know it's quite ludicrous to see that wonky cricket stunt, you know, mm. over there. Um, so how I suppose my questions are how do how how does um, Portuguese Uma politics, of which I'm sure there's much Bengali uh, participation, how does it engage with this troublesome, awkward colonial and pre-colonial Muslim identity? Uh, was that someone else's research? No, 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 no. no well, I, I haven't done research on that, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so I'm just going to throw some ideas at it. Um, there's one, one interesting aspect of, of this that you're mentioning is a rhetoric, kind of a, this post-colonial rhetoric, rhetoric that justifies the presence of segments of Bangladeshis in Portugal in the sense that the 
the reenactment of an historical tie through the presence of Portuguese in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and this has been, to a certain extent, mobilized by certain segments of the Bangladeshi population to justify their presence in Portugal. And this has been seen. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not kind of, I'm not reproducing it acritically. Okay, what I'm saying is they are using it to carve a place in the public space. So for instance, this same neighborhood that I was just showing um, is at some point it was visited by the president of the republic as a kind of this presidency, open presidency that included migrant migration issues. And the first thing that one of the members of the Bangladeshi population did was to approach him and give him a book, 19th century book, uh, entitled The Portuguese in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and, and he said, look, they, they go, it, it, this, is, this is the proof that we are linked together in one way or the other. And this colonial, all this colonial link has been mobilized as a way to um, carve a place, or is try to, trying to carve a place for, well, carve a place in the public space. That, 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 um, but, uh, but I'm not sure if I'm going there. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I'm trying to think of the political process in terms of issues, mm -hmm. and what are some of the issues and problems around which potential leaders of the Bangladesh community in Lisbon would appeal to people, would appeal to the population? Well, you know, we haven't heard as much about problems that are distinctive to the Bangladesh community or to the migrant communities in general. You, you mentioned there the lower rung of the labor um, hierarchy, but are there issues that have come up or that you see coming up on which people would say, we don't care if this person is our Ami League or uh, BNP or Jamaat, but you know, we, yes. we want them to represent us on this issue in the yeah. Portuguese political uh, yeah. process? There, there's one who, there was and has been uh, uh, a huge issue which is about um, um, access to citizenship rights. So beginning with uh, legalization processes uh, to naturalization processes. And one of the things that people argue is that there should be an association that deals with these issues regarding the Portuguese authorities. And for several segments of Bangladeshi population, the idea is the creation of this association was seen as a way of doesn't matter if Awami, BNP, or Jamaat, they will help, they should help people kind of overcome their structural fragilities regarding, for instance, citizenship rights. And the, the instrument to do this would be this association. Um, having said this, of course, if you talk to each segment of the political spectrum, they will argue that some will do it better than the others. Uh, but the, 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 one of the main things is this, so the access to citizenship rights, and at the same time, and the second one, is the reunification processes. Because it has to do with very, a very bureaucratic process that happens. There's, no, there's now a consular office, in Portuguese consular office in Dhaka, but it's only to business. So for instance, if, you're, if you live in Portugal and you go there, you need to take care of the reunification process of your wife, say, or if she needs to go there or whatever, uh, you can't go there. You have to go to New Delhi, to the Portuguese embassy. And this creates a huge amount of problems, as you can imagine, regarding, because they schedule interviews, then they cancel them at the last moment, they don't care, they, they take ages, and people spend a lot of money, the whole thing, it's a hectic situation. Again, the situation would be a moment, the association would be a moment, or an institution that would be taking care of this specific problem. Mm -hmm. yep. Is there a Bangladesh embassy in Lisbon? Yes, it just, it just opened uh, on the 21st of February okay. this year. <laughs> so there's a kind of a, there's a setting up, it, it, the ambassador is not there still, but they are uh, setting it up, so officially it's running. Uh, but the ambassador is not still there. Is it just? Yes, yes, yes. We're just waiting for the director of the film Shongra. He's, he's on his way, just slightly late. Um, 
we'll end soon, but I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, Jody want to ask. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, thank you. That's really um, fascinating talk. I just wanted to use this opportunity to ask you a little bit more about migration of Bangladeshis from Lisbon to the UK. Mm -hmm. um, working in East London, I've seen an increase in the number of maybe second generation African Portuguese coming here for various reasons. But listening to this, um, it kind of chimes with some of the things that they've said to me um, in terms of the kind of rejecting of this kind of migrant identity. Um, but I haven't asked them in detail. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit about that. There's a, there's a growing, uh, we were just talking about it earlier on. Um, there's a growing tendency currently in the past two years, which is the old generation, so the first, mi well, the, the migrants, the, the, the migrants, <laughs> um, to move away, re migrate. And uh, as Portuguese nationals, uh, some of them are moving to the UK. Um, they are going to South Hall or East Ham, um, and so there's a growing there's a growing process which is interesting. You have these families all established in Lisbon and in Portugal with kids in schools, etc. And they come to the UK. Uh, they are moving to the UK in order to invest in their children's education. So to put them in through, into uh, British universities. And the argument is, look. Um, I'm investing in my uh, kids uh, because I know that if they're going to study in a Portuguese university, well, fair enough, it's, it's Portuguese, uh, but if they study in an English university, their future will be brighter. Um, and so there's this second kind of a re-migration process happening, uh, especially among the most well-off, which leave their businesses in for instance, they keep their businesses, some of them, some of, the, some of the businesses are kept in Portugal, others are sold, they move to the UK, they put their children in English universities, they move back and forth. In all, on one hand, continuing their political participation, continuing their economic activities, but they move back and forth, which is a, a very new, very recent tendency. And it's intimately related with the access to Portuguese nationality. And in, in here, I think it's very good to, to mobilize Iowa Wong stuff on flexible citizenship, because that's really what it is. It's a kind of aspirational migration, where the, the idea is we're not migrants in the sense that we will invest in a household back in Bangladesh. We are migrants in the sense that we want to move around. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call it cosmopolitanism because of all these elite overtones, but it's kind of this, it's literally a flexible citizenship process in the sense that they want to have the possibility, uh, like James Ferguson say, says, of participating in this global social cultural order where they can move around in one way or the other. And so they are. They have the possibility of investing in a business in Lisbon, they, they invest in their kids' education in the UK, and then eventually, I don't know, buy some property in Paris, doesn't, doesn't matter. They create the possibility of moving around, um, especially in, in overcoming all these structural conditionalities of class, racialization, Islamophobia, all this kind of stuff. I just want to share two uh, really historical links uh, between Bengal, Bangladesh and, and uh, Portugal. I was reading a book by Sanjay Subramanian and in the book he talks about a particular uh, Portuguese official who got done for um, fraud and embezzlement and when they, you know, looking at all his properties, all his uh, wealth, he had 18 slaves, you know, um, he owned 18 slaves, and six of those slaves were Bengali slaves. That was in the uh, probably mid or late 1500s. I don't remember the exact date. Mm -hmm. And another one I want to share with you is um, the uh, Mughal governor in Bengal, in, in uh, Shah Shuza, I think Shah Shuza. When his father died or was about to die, you know, the power 
uh, brothers uh, started to fight for the throne and he lost out to Aurangzeb. Uh, but then when he was trying to escape because Aurangzeb sent his people to deal with his brother and he took so much money from Bengal, <laughs> incredible amount of wealth, and he tried to escape to Arakan. And the Portuguese agreed to help him, you know, with their ships and their, their lot of uh, activities around, uh, around the coast, you know, to take, uh, help him escape. So what the Portuguese did, on the way to Arakan, they deliberately sank one of the ships with so much money, and then they stole it, right? <laughs> And Portuguese are very active uh, in the 1500s, all throughout 1500s, they sort of dominated the sin. They also captured a lot of Bengali slaves, Bengali people, and took them into slavery, sold them in slave market in Arakan, Maraud, and in Kipli, in Urissa. Right? And, and the Dutch, what a lot of Portuguese brought slaves, Bengali slaves, and took them to um, Banda Islands in Indonesia to work on nutmeg plantation. So there is a lot of uh, things to discover. Uh, the uh, director of Shangram is here. And what I will do now, because many of you arrived after we announced uh, the lunch sort of arrangement, uh, you know there is a cafe downstairs and you are welcome to go and have lunch there. And there are many restaurants nearby. But what we did, we uh, had a discussion with the restaurant and you know, we can get lunch for you. Right? Um, it's, uh, you know, it'll be rice and uh, meat. Meat is actually beef, not lamb. I just found it's beef. And chicken and vegetable. So I think I only had full of five people ordered, uh, you know, before. It cost three pounds. Uh, but we, we, with so many people came up to us, we ordered 20. So if you want to join us, it's three, we'll get three pounds each, right? We'll have this lunch uh, in after Monsoor uh, shows his, uh, 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 in a documentary trailer, and, sorry, film trailer, feature film trailer, and talk to you about his, his project. I'd just like to thank Jose. Thank you for coming. It's been really fascinating. I hope you will enjoy it and, uh, and, and you will stay and, and throughout the day. So while Mansoor is uh, sort of setting up the video, uh, you can relax for a few minutes. <laughs> thank you.